The following podcast contained mature language and adult discussions. Kevin. Kevin. I. Hi, Steve. Hi. He's. I'm looking for Kevin. While I keep looking, welcome everyone to click this, the Kevin Nash podcast. I'm Sean. I'm. This uh, is not Kevin. I'm not Kevin Nash. I am. Just for anyone who was confused. Producer Steve Kaufman. uh, Right on this wall, there's actually a, it's actually a big whiteboard that said this many days without a best of. We made it over 365. But and but you know what? This is even more special than that because it's it's not a best of of the previous click this podcast material. We're giving we're actually giving everybody something very special today. Um if you are a member of the um Eleven Soft, the Click This TV subscription, then you've been participating in uh, Nash and Friends, where Kev, me, and the subscribers sit down for a little bull session with uh, with special guests like Sean Walton and Rob Van Dam, RJ City, Enzo, Russo, Sullivan. So we thought, as uh, as Kevin has been, uh, his his voice has been taken ill. I mean, I talked to him. I thought, I mean, he made Jack Klugman look sound like Celine Dion. It was unbelievable. Um, so we thought. Let's give him some new Kev, but in the context of these great interviews, our uh, sitting around sessions for uh, Nash and Friends. So you're still going to be getting a whole lot of Kevs. Those are very, very few people in our listening audience that are not subscribers, that did not uh, go to Click This TV and watch these great shows already. We're going to give you some of the Nash and Friends. Um, And and, why fuck around? All right, let's get right into this. Um, Who could you start? Nash and friends with on a show called Click This than uh than anyone other than Sean Waltman. X Pac Six himself uh joined us for the very first Nash and Friends. Um and uh what a great I, I think we talked for an hour and a half the show. If you go to clickthistv.com and sign up, you can watch the entire show. Speaking Fans, of over over delivering yeah. that one. It was both a group hang, so everyone got to hang out and ask questions of Sean Waltman and Kevin Nash, and they got to watch a wrestling match with Sean Waltman and Kevin Nash. Yeah, that that yeah, was that tag match. That was the first. That was the first Nash and Friends where we realized it should be one or the other. It's either going to be a, a match watch along or a group hangout. Right. Can't be both. <clears throat> so you got both here. You got both here. So we're gonna first. We're gonna hear um, Sean and Kevin talking about wrestling's product today. I mean, they were part of the one of the most over factions in the history of the business. Um, and, uh, did amazing business, but would it have worked today? What would work today? What works today? What doesn't work today? Here's Nash and Waltman and me and, and all of our click this TV family chopping it up about today's wrestling. We couldn't have timed that fucking boot finish. Dude, everything, the the fucking whole thing was timed perfectly. It really was. And it's, it's, it's just funny how, like you say, it was, it wasn't our regular psychology. But for some reason that night it was. Guys, why today we have very athletic wrestlers um, on in the may in the majors? Why can't we see a match like that today? I tell no goddamn story. <laughs> Is it that simple? It's not that simple. Is it timing? Is there a uh, is there something I mean, that's not being trained? What is it? Number one, the belts have to mean something. That's number one. So it, it, that <laughs> that sets. And then you know, back in that in that era, it wasn't like you got televised fucking tag uh, titles. We were you still know, five pay per views back then. You know how um, you know how like. Years ago, like when we were younger, like uh, 
I mean, there would be movies with special effects, but they still had to be good fucking movies, right? Like, yeah. And then, like, once the better special effects came, you would see it kind of start to slip when it came to, like... Yeah, that's... I, you know, I've, said it a lot. All... I've said that a lot about, like, you know, the WrestleMania. It's like, the WrestleMania now is, like, Marvel. And even you know? the matches, like, the fucking... The, the, they do Co- much... Everything, the costume ...more intricate and... moves, so that's, like, fucking... Yeah, those moves are, like, absolutely. special effects to me. And, like, it's so, you know, it's easier... Because you're getting, you're getting reactions out of the moves. Yeah, you know, so it's like it's sometimes it's hard to different differentiate like the different re- kinds of reactions, like a, a reaction for, for a move versus like you know the other reaction, like the in between the move I'll, stuff. Like I always say this, and I know you know it, it's um, I know that in our era we never had eighty six thousand people two nights in a row in a fucking football field, so. Mm. everybody's doing I mean, it's just a different fucking you know <clears throat> right now i don't want to sound like we're fucking uh fans of the godfather 2 like that's like that's, that's the greatest film of all time it's like, not <laughs> it's not but um why, I, what, wait what 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 do you what do you say no, oliver that, no happy trip not godfather 3 is fucking greatest movie oh of all yeah, time. yeah. They need to put more Sofia Coppola in it um, to a, right. a new edit. Um, but I still contend, I mean, I still will say that the the belts were not of consequence to me watching that. Now, the the build up to that and maybe the, uh, the excitement around the fact that the belts may change hands because they didn't as often as they do now. But that match, if you took the belts out of it and showed it today, I think it would still have the same jaw-dropping effect on the precision of four wrestlers who seemingly don't take a pause. Everything is believable, except the, the double team on the abdominal stretch. Everything's believable. Um, everything's crisp. Nothing's fucking blown. And maybe if it is, I didn't notice it because you guys knew how to fucking cover. I, I, I don't think it's even any of the angles, the belts, nothing. I just think it it, serve, it stands as an athletic competition. I think some, like, some, you put, put some guys out there that they care less about, that the fans care less about, you know, and they can have the same, match. obviously, like, a lot, I think some of that to do with, we were just over it, like, you know, the, the people cared about, we had emotional <laughs> equity built up. Plus, we were going to, I mean, the fact that it was us four. So yeah. we were, we were going to go, I mean, we were going to give extra because we were out there with our boys. Yeah. You know, so and a lot like, of people there, like, even though, like, the, the internet wasn't a thing yet, you know, the behind-the-scenes news, you know, the, the smarter wrestling band, there was a smaller, you know, um, percentage of them, but a lot of them were in that area, right? And they yeah, knew, I mean, like, they had the, the they, they could the get the sheets. Was. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. knew the quick was. They knew they'd, what we were. They'd go to we're all four in the ring together. Yeah, they go to lookers and see all four of us fucking hanging out. Yeah, so they, I think they knew it was something that was probably going to be special. Yeah, uh, too hard and fierce uh, brings up a good point. It was high octane, but I wouldn't call it a spot fest. Not at all. No, they were the peaks and valleys and the and the. Well, if some, you if there, someone there was, was selling, they fucking logically sold. I mean, they you, didn't you, bounce you, back up and use the leg that just got the the fact that you said the the abdominal stretch was fucking bogus, but it was a hole like that. You know, that and not then, the abdominal stretch, the the the, the pull, the thing, the pull. yeah, oh, that the pull. That's physics. Come on, man. That's physics. God, I thought you. Well, you're like, got a few cut here you can split, Sean. All right, it's time for the fans to talk to uh, uh, Kevin. Bry bar, sir. <laughs> I got one more, uh, one more real quick question, guys, and I'll, I'll jump off here. Uh, Go ahead. Cornette, uh, Jim Cornette, I know you guys bust on him a lot in the podcast. You know, being from Louisville, I've had breakfast with him, have, I've had meals with him, I've met him in person. I mean, how is he overall received in the industry? I know I know his, 
his views are way out there and stuff and it, and it's easy to hop on the the corny bash bandwagoner but i mean is he pretty well received in the industry overall or is it kind of split in the middle we always do it with love on the show if that's what you're talking about i think no we, it's we, great we, trust we, me we like corny every time i don't think i don't think that i don't think that i i, I, I can speak for myself um, I have, there's absolutely no heat with, with Jim Cornette. You know, like I, I've said it, you know, several times, I'm, I'm sure on the show that, you know, at TNA, he and I were, we, we were, you know, the guy having the same argument in the room, oh, that doesn't make sense. And me and Cornette would be like, that, that doesn't make sense. Why, why would we do that? Because we're going to fucking stack the fucking finish. It's going to be a, a bunch of high spots. That doesn't make any sense. But. Sean, you uh, you a corny fan as well? I always was. You know, like, I mean, I was a fucking supermarket when I was a kid. You know, <laughs> so I liked the fucking Midnight Express. And, you know, Cornette was great on the stick. And, you know, so, yeah. They just... He's a real smart guy. I don't like if I have like fucking. I, I mentioned this on my show one time. I just like even if I do have like a disagreement with something Cornette says, I fucking I don't fucking air it out in public, you know, because um, I'm not like a guy that likes to go back and forth with people. And like I, so he could fucking slice you and dice you, you know. With, and I just don't want to get like I'm good. <laughs> Kev's like, fucking Kev can still go to battle if you want. I'm not nah, gonna. No, nah, he's Cornette. <laughs> Cornette just just the fucking the willpower to put out fucking twenty three hours a fucking week of a fucking programming. And it's one episode. It's, it's like the Chinese. Yeah, it's I like the Chinese, Chinese army, man. <laughs> what a great vibe, man. I mean, people love Walton as they should, and then having him hanging with with Kev and just, I mean, I think. A room of, well, I don't know, 30, 40, however many were there that night. Felt like they were part of the clique. It was so cool. And uh, lest lest we forget Jim Cornette having come up. In. He's, I, God, I, I, I put Jim on, I don't know how many kayfabe shows we, I don't know, eight maybe, something like that. Each one was great. Um, I don't listen to his podcast weekly. I was on it as a guest. Uh, some years back, early on, uh, but I, I, of course, I just don't have time. I'd love to listen, but I don't have time. And I have to know: is is it like fever pitch, maniacal bellowing for three hours on each of the shows? How do you do that and have a normal blood pressure? I, I don't. I don't know. Sprite has no caffeine, right? Is no, that part of it? No, okay, so that no, maybe that's, that's part of it. He doesn't need caffeine. Oh, so he's like the listener's meth. Like you go there when you want to get jacked or caffeine. You should say, or whatever, Pretty much. I guess, or don't want to encourage that. But uh, listen, if you want to be part of that kind of hang, if you want to see um, previous Nash and Friends episodes, plus you get to be at live tapings every week. When we tape our podcast that you're watching or listening to now, we do have the entire um, click this TV audience watching live, asking questions at the end, throwing in comments throughout the show. And you're part of the pre-show. We like to um, have some fun and warm up beforehand. And, you know, you'll be in there. You get the show early. You get it without commercials. Go to clickthistv.com and check it out. Um, if you do, you're going to see a nice uh, interview, a nice Nash and Friends with the one and only Vince Russo. Now, Vince and Kev work together. Um, and uh, I think have a, a real fondness for each other, appreciation for what each other did. And, you know, Russo was writing Kevin's kind of programming, edgy, different, just like just like uh, Scott and, and, and Kev and, and Eric figured out that uh, wrestling needed uh, teeth again. And that was something that Vince uh, Russo noticed also. So here's, uh, here's Vince Russo on Nash and Friends with all of us. Talking about the one and only Paul Heyman. I, I hate it, bro. You, you know what I say? If the WWE wants to save money, and I've been saying this for the last two years, bro. Bro, remember remember what movie was it? Remember Mary Poppins, bro? You know, Sean, you know, bro. You and I, remember the same age. Remember Mary Poppins with uh, 
uh, Julie Andrews, Dick Van Dyke. Dick Van Dyke. Yeah. And remember then the animated animals would come out and dance and sing, uh. that, bro? Yes. Bro, listen, here's my Paul Heyman idea. Bro, make him an animated character on the TV because he's a cartoon anyway. So have him come out with Roman, but he's animated, bro. This way, you don't got to pay him. You don't got to pay for the trans. You don't got to pay for the playing fair. Let him just be a cartoon, bro. Because that's what he, bro, he kills it for me. He kills it for me with the over the top faces and overacting and the, the, the hand. Oh my, bro. And what does it go back to? You know what it goes back to, Sean? Nobody would act that way. That's what it goes back to. Nobody would ever act that way. Only in wrestling, bro. Really? You really, right? really. So, so, so you think that after being on the television for like 10 years, that you wouldn't come out every week and tell the crowd what, what <laughs> your you name are. was? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, it, it drives me. Nuts. Okay, here's my, here's my new pet peeve. <laughs> Not even pet peeve. This makes it where I have to mute raw. Do you pull inspiration to create these things? Is it movies, other shows, uh, books? I mean, where where can you possibly get the the inspiration to write that many storylines every single week and then continue on week after week? Bro, I say this all the time. It is not rocket science. And if you're doing it the right way, it writes itself. And let me let, let me really break it down to you to how simple it could be. Because, you know, when, when I had my success during the Attitude Era, you got to remember, there were, there were two guys. It was me and Ferrara. We wrote the whole show. We brought it to Vince. He would put in his little nuances, but that was the show. Nothing changed the day of the show. That was the show. I would send it out to all the talent before they even got to the arena. That was the show. Well, we, we've gone from that to 57 writers. Unbelievable. Here's how <sighs> simple it is. And this is why I don't, I, I'm not a rocket science. Here's how simple it is. You create characters, okay? And I mean, you create real characters. You know everything about those characters. You know what, what they eat what they when they shit when you know these characters inside and out you know how they're going to act under every circumstance and and they become real when, when i would write for a character i would put myself in the boots of stone cold steve austin in the boots of kevin nash in the boots of Shawn michaels i became that character when i was writing for them so now if you've got characters developed now you look at, okay, bro, depending on their characters, what's going to be a compelling story? What two characters are going to meld together and really tell a great story? Because what happens is, bro, th th there's a huge difference, man. When Ed Ferrara and myself were there, you had writers writing a television show. Aside from that time, bro, You've got bookers booking a wrestling show. And here's the difference. When you've got honest to goodness television writers, they create the character, they create the story, and through the characters and the story, the match develops. It develops organically. Bro, it's the complete opposite when you got bookers writing wrestling. What they look at first is, What's going to be the best match? If we put so-and-so in there with so-and-so, that's going to be the best match. And then they try to make sense out of that match. They work try backwards. to make sense. They yeah, it's, they try yeah. to make sense. Me meanwhile, you create the characters and the story first, and now organically we're getting to the match. It's not rocket science, bro. And, and I say this all the time. It writes itself because he, here's what used to happen. If I ever used to get stuck, I would sit right at my desk and say, okay, if this were real, what would happen? It, it's that simple. If, if this were real, 
How would these people react? And that's why back then it was so real and you believed it because you really stayed true to the characters. That's gone, bro. Like that, man, I, I get so depressed because I watch some great television with, with great characters. And then you put on this wrestling show and you, you, you've got 20 minute matches where they're making the match in the back. Okay, that, that's how matches are made. We, we bump into each other in the back. We got a match. Then you've, you've got a 15 minute match where you already know the outcome before the bell rings. So that 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 that's what it's become, and 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 that's the that's the frustrating part to me, man. Because I don't I don't know how it went sideways so quickly. What do you? Know, you is there anything they're doing right? Like, what do you think of like the bloodline angle? What 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 do you like now? You know, Sean, I I got to be honest with you. I'm not like these other people. I'm not going to lower the bar. Okay, everybody has lowered the bar be because the bloodline was the only story across both shows. This was now the, the greatest story in the history. No, it's not, bro. It's 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 about a family that that and there's fighting within. We we've seen it a billion times, but it has been so lowered. I gotta tell you something that includes Kevin. Kevin's gonna appreciate this. Bro, WWE was getting so bad with T.L. Hopper, Freddie Joe Floyd, who, uh. what, where, when. And, bro, I'm watching what I'm watching with Eric and Kevin and Scott are doing with the NWO. And I'm like, holy shit. I am calling Kevin and Jeff Jarrett, begging them to get me on the phone with Bischoff, <laughs> begging them. I so wanted out because they were doing it. And Kevin, I will never forget this, bro. At the time, bro, I was a junior writer. C Cornette and Bruce were the writers of the show. I was sitting in, you know, as a student, and I'll never forget that, bro. I would sit there every week and I would say to myself, do you guys, you guys, do you guys understand how much this sucks as you're writing it on the page? <laughs> like, do you, do you not see it? This is horrible. Kevin, I'm at, I'm at Bruce's house when Hogan comes out. And I'll never forget, bro, I'm at Bruce's house. And, and I said it out loud. Bruce was right there. I'm like, bro, we're fucked. Like, game <laughs> over. Like, this is over we we are so far on the opposite side of what they're doing bro i knew like 83 weeks I, it was over bro oh, it, over. yeah <laughs> yeah and it, you know and it was it took it took them to the point of like a, almost going bankrupt to go okay we got to change things yeah they were in the red bro people don't understand that they were in the red at that point yeah, yeah, it is. David, did you have more? Uh, no, not really. I just wanted to uh, follow up with you know, nowadays, like you said, there's you know, a hundred writers in there. It seems like when there was just the two of you or three of you with you know, with the other Vince overlooking it, things got done better, better quality, quicker. And now with all the writers, maybe they can't agree on one thing, maybe they're all off doing something else, but you know, they're they're the theory would be the more writers there are, the more content there would be, but it's just the opposite. It, because they're running into each other. You know, li li like Kevin said, bro, that writing schedule, there isn't Ugh. enough time to have 30 people involved. Th there just isn't enough time because now I'm going to pitch it to you and you're going to give me your pitch back and then you're not going to like what I'm pitching. Meanwhile, the days of the week are passing <laughs> by. All of a sudden, bro, it's Monday and we don't have anything and Vince is rewriting the show at the last minute. It, it, it is not conducive to having 20 writers when you are writing two live television shows every week. Yeah. You know what they're asking in the chat, Vince? They want to know what you thought think of Paul Heyman with Bloodline. All right. We are back here in the control room. Um, you know, I'm thinking as I'm watching this, I'm thinking Russo and and Heyman and 
I mean, me and Nash are sitting there. So um, the amount of money that could be spent on therapy uh, with that group alone is outrageous. And um, you know what? To get some good therapy, folks are going to have to pay. And guys, I could tell you right now, it's time for healthcare to get a facelift. We know this. So let me just remind everyone, you can stop sending money to big insurance companies that profit off of not paying the bills. Did you know that 48 million claims on Obamacare last year were denied? That's one-fifth of claims that are going to get rejected. Do you want to take that chance for yourself? Health insurance sucks. It's just confusing. It's expensive. It's frustrating. There's a better way. Welcome to the alternative. Guys, it's 2023. On the dawn of 2024, we're, we're crowdsourcing stuff. Crowd Health was created to get rid of the headaches of health insurance. For $175 for an individual or $575 for a family of four, you'll get access to a community of people who are willing to help out in the event of an emergency. You also get telemedicine visits, discounted prescriptions, and more. All this without doctors' networks getting in the way. Let Crowd Health help with your health care needs. You can get started today for just $99 per month for the first three months when you use the code WRESTLE, W-R-E-S-T-L-E, to get the health care you deserve. Crowd Health is not insurance. You can learn more at joincrowdhealth.com. That's joincrowdhealth.com. Use the code WRESTLE. Get started today for just $99 a month for the first three months. And uh, we are here doing the best of Nash and Friends, the very special subscription show on clickthistv.com where we, uh, we hang with the fans and the boys. One of the guys I enjoy talking to whenever I see him is Rob Van Dam. Rob's uh, just one of those very real cats, you know? Almost too real for wrestling is Rob Van Dam. And um, this is, uh, we're going to talk to him about TNA here, and then I love a little locker room zen discussion whenever I can get some of that from RVD. It's hilarious. Check it out. The, um... TNA, so, uh, the TNA 2010, I mean, it had everybody from WCW I wanted to see, all the best young stars in the world. You guys reformed the Wolf Pack, Nash Hall and uh, Six there. They did the Monday Night War kickoff with the uh, RVD. Like, why? I personally think, like, that Monday Night War generation was – um. 25 years old, not married, right out of college. I mean, you could have raised Andre and they wouldn't have tuned in. I loved all that shit. And I, I was just curious what you guys think. Like, why didn't that hit? I mean, you guys had everything. I, I'll tell you what, I mean, what, what I think. During the impact, um, they would have 23 minutes of when it was on Spike. They'd have 23 minutes of fucking uh, UFC, but you would never, ever see any cr- cross promotion or any ad for the wrestling on UFC, let alone Spike. I mean, they okay. just did not. It was just like they didn't. It was just bullshit. I mean, this, it's like, I, I, and I know Rob has done the same thing. It's like you, you walk into a town and it's it, it's you're in Des Moines. You walk into the Gold's Gym and eight guys go, "What the fuck are you guys doing here? Yeah. Well, we're, we're working here tonight." Yeah. Like it d- doesn't matter. Like if, if nobody knows where, that you're there, man, they're they're not gonna watch. Mm. Fair point. Uh, when when you turned on EY and uh, Scott was yelling at the <sighs> camera, hit the music, and the Wolfpack music hit. I tell you, my household lost their shit. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, man. And um, I don't think they wanted to draw. That's that's like because as long as like that during that whole <coughs> uh, three or three and a half year run or whatever I had, um, there was signs that they didn't give a shit. You know, like I, me and Mike Weber, you know, tried to talk about going to conventions to extend the brand recognition in different ways, and and there was just. The, he, he he talking through him i always felt like most of the ideas they just didn't care and there was the fact that during the whole time the house shows that i was there anyway drew about the same 900 people or so like the whole time and and, and there was always always rumors 
that they were going to fold the next week. They were on their yep. last leg. Like even boys, you know, my, my, some of my friends in the business, Rob, I just want, I just want you to know, like they're, they're probably not going to be around long. So, and mm -hmm. like a cockroach, they just keep on going and they're still there. And it's, I don't know if I, I think they're still probably drawing the, you know, not more than that anyway. No, so. le less, less now, but I mean, still there, like I said, they're still, they are still there. Yeah. Yeah, I remember them going off the air with some cool visuals, like with Hogan holding your arm in the air, RVD with the bell and the confetti falling. It's like, yeah, I just it just didn't catch to me how everybody wasn't talking about that shit, and it wasn't higher in the ratings. Just I also um, heard I also heard a rumor from a uh, in the industry source back then that there were certain guys in the office that were set there to um to sabotage mm. like the guys that were on top at that time that they were there just to uh and and uh and a reference was made to um howard finkel the same guy told me howard finkel had a lifetime job with vince because he was a mole uh in uh, her Abrams company and then oh, no uh, shit. It, yep, and then uh, so he, that's that's what he said, and then he, you know, I'm I'm not going to mention um, Eric Vince and Hulk, but the guys that were on top at that time, you know, also <laughs> were there to <laughs> to keep things low, keep things lowing. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah. You got anything else, Ant? If you keep the if you keep the rudder on a hard left, boy, it's it's amazing how you're going in a circle. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they love they love that circle. That's that's where they're comfortable. Absolutely, man. <laughs> now, really digging the new podcast, RVD. You and Dom doing a hell of a job, and Kev, always a pleasure, brother. Thanks, man. It's good yeah. to see you, Anthony. Good All right, you. Anthony. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Jen wanted us to ask a question. I don't think she wanted to be on camera. Uh, Rob, what is your guilty pleasure TV show? Um, Court Cam. It's one of my favorites all week. Court like Cam. they freak out and jump over the bailiff to get to the that's defendant and shit. Yeah, that's part of it. And they, and they tell like some pretty brutal lead ups to why that dude's sitting there in court before you see the family, you know, trying to kill him in court or or whatever. But I, I like nonfiction a lot, you know, so I watch Court Cam, Body Cam. I like the Playboy um, murders or whatever. No, what is it? The whatever that mysteries, whatever that is. I don't know. Playboy thing. Um, there you go. I watched. All right. What else is there? Did I, uh, did I miss anyone's questions? I wouldn't want to uh, slight anyone. I like the family still own, but they're in between seasons. I tell you, yeah, about, I, I, if you guys get a, if you guys get a chance uh, on Max. They just started that uh, Kim Kardashian Kanye West divorce thing. <laughs> oh yeah, Katie. Was. Oh dude, don't, it's it's fucking unbelievable. Really? Oh, oh my god. Well, how? It's, what what what's intriguing uh, about it? The the fact that it's it's it, <laughs> I, I can't even explain it. It's it's uh, number one. I have to say this: I have never watched an episode of the Kardashians. I know her from snippets, bits. I mean, I, I don't know anything. And I knew Kanye because I listened to a, a, some of his music early. But once he put the red hat on, it was like, okay, you're not on my team. Um, but it is like they were... I didn't realize like they've been together like since 2000 and maybe fucking six or they got four kids. They've been together a really, really long time. They were worth $2 mm -hmm. billion. And I mean, he just, I, I, I guess I've just never seen anybody completely go off the rails as much as he, as he has, you know, with yeah. like, and the thing is, it's like, man, like, and I forget one of the comedians used the term like, when did Kanye think that looking dusty was fucking 
Like that was the down look. And he called it dusty. And he does. He looks dirty, you know. And it just, yeah. and it, the poor guy, man. And you know, he had entourage after entourage. And he fucking t- took care of a lot of people. And when, when, when he needed somebody, man, there was nobody there for him. I was, mm. I guess I felt, I felt bad. I felt sorry for him, man. I, I'm thinking to myself like, fuck, man. If I, if I would have been anywhere in his fucking vicinity, I would at least put a fucking hand out and said, dude, let's, 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 let's see if we can't, you know, get you smoking a little fucking little, little bud and fucking chilling a little bit, man. Are you at least watching the Amber Heard Johnny Depp? Uh, nah, I, I watched. On, I, 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 I want. I, nah, it's. She was like I, I got along with her. She was really kind to me. She was. She, she seemed like a pretty, you know, like everything's very negative about her, and I don't know why things went negative. I don't know. It's like the the person that they they portrayed was the person that I spent, I don't know, fifteen, sixteen weeks of my life with. So. That picture of you and her came up at a very poignant time when we had just announced the podcast. People accused us of making the announcement for this for this show when the photo of you was introduced in the divorce proceedings. Well, that, yeah, that was it. But the timing of that was it, it, I'm, I'm in the same shirt with Amber Heard as I am with Jada Pinkett. After Good that, see you whole, cleaning up that after, night. Wow. At, at, after that whole fucking fiasco went down with with the Oscars, mm-hmm. I mean, it was like all within like four weeks, and it, I'm, I'm like, they're like, well, "What did you hook up with them both?" I'm like, yeah, "Yeah, in the same shirt on the same night at a fucking rap party for a fucking movie." Are you fucking kidding me? All right, uh, six eight has work. our last it takes, question. It takes work balancing a thruple, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> Especially when one, especially when one of them wants to shit in the bed the whole time. <laughs> Six hey, eight, Kevin. wrap us up, brother. Wait, can, right. I, can I ask Kevin a question? We got time. Yeah, you, oh. you want to ask Kevin a question? Go ahead. Yeah, because I think it was him. I just want uh, confirmation. Uh, a wise man and uh, once said that people always say their wife is their best friend, but if you can't point a chick out across the room and say oh my god look at she has an amazing ass then then she's really not your best friend was that you that said that Kevin? yeah yeah okay i've <laughs> said that okay i thought so yeah the only I've, i just want to say uh i'm i'm so that. with my wife katie forbes and and the only the only uh reason that 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 uh that that i wouldn't be able to point it out would be that she would probably point it out first she's very chill She's very cool like that, and we're very happy. And I'm bragging. Yeah, she's. A, I, I think she's a. She's a. She's a great girl. Yeah, word. You earned the right. Good uh, six eight. Get your get your action in there. Hey, how's it going, RVD? She's not a girl. She's she's a woman. <laughs> I know that's right. Yep. <laughs> Her girlfriend. Can you hear me? Too. What? We, we hear you, man. <laughs> All right, cool. Eric Bischoff here again, telling you about our friends over at SaveWithConrad.com. Now, Conrad's always talking about how they are helping homeowners save money, but did you know that Conrad and his team can also help you become a homeowner? They make the home buying process more enjoyable than, I don't know, making out with Stephanie and Linda. Ouch, but don't take my word for it. Hi, I'm Sarah Davis, and I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, So my husband has been a huge fan of Conrad's podcast for many, many years. And for years we were on road trips and he would have me listen to it. And then I got really into it. And so when it came time for us to buy a house, it was kind of like, there's really no other option at this point. Like we have to go down this path, right? It was the best. I worked with Steve. I don't know what to do. I was looking more for preparing to buy a house. How do I get this in order? What does this need to look like? What do I need to move around? What's more important that I pay off first? Because I'm a first time home buyer. I don't know what that needs to look like. So that's when I called you guys and I talked with, with Steve and phenomenal from day one. I got a full education on home buying before I was ever asked to fill out an application, before I was ever asked to do anything, which is just, I mean, I cannot, brag on you guys enough. I literally cannot tell enough people about you. 
because we would not have a home if it weren't for you, if it weren't for that interaction and weren't for the learning process. And I feel like I went into being a first time home buyer from the time, by the time we got through the end of the process with the same education that people need four or five homes to buy. And so now I feel like, all right, well, we can do this. We can do real estate. We can, I can actually make good decisions and ask good questions at closing and beyond because of everything that you taught me. My name is Sarah Davis, and I got into my dream home with Save With Conrad. And unlike the dirt sheets, we're not making this up. Check out all the five-star reviews. Go to savewithconrad.com and do it today. You'll be grateful you did. NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lender. Woo! But, you know, uh, I have my own values that are pretty strong uh, uh, and, that I use that are the foundation behind all of my thoughts and uh, actions and decisions. And that's what RV theology is about. And we talk about that on my podcast. I thought one of the, one of the highlights for us was um, we, we were, we were showing tapes. You, you, we showed a tape of you and it was when uh, JBL would walk in the locker room and you, you, <laughs> were, you were saying how he just completely fucked your Zen up. Yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, like, but it, but it was like it was it was like so pure and so honest, and it yeah. wasn't it wasn't like fucking it wasn't with malice. It was no. just matter of fact, man. I was just like, no. man, he just fucked my zen up, man. Like, and you were like, here comes in this big Texan. <laughs> Yeah. I'm a big, bad, loud motherfucking Texan. <laughs> we but sat here and fucking laughed our asses off. Yeah, I, but I feel like it is intentional on their part. It's a control drama that they use to get everyone's attention. So, you know, there's a, a wise man once said, it's never a good idea to be the uh, loudest one in the room. That's obviously there's exceptions to everything, but I feel like, you know, um, I, I kind of... I kind of live similar to to that quote. And uh, when there's the loudest person, it always draws my attention. And I know right away, I'm not going to want to be around this person for very long. <laughs> They're way, <laughs> way too loud and dramatic for me. You know, that I was think great. What, happen, what, what happens in life, though, is like, right. when you're like, one of the, one of the, 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 the rules early in wrestling is before you realize that it's not, is, the loudest person isn't right. And so many people say, well, if I fucking say it louder, you know, it's like you go over and you work in Japan and the guy doesn't really speak English. And you listen to these guys fucking just say it louder to him. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, oh, well, fuck, I just didn't hear you. Like, <laughs> motherfucker, he doesn't understand you. <laughs> Yeah, Fans, uh, yeah, we are here for you as well. Get your questions in for Rob. Let Steve compile the order. Let's get one up here. I think Josh has been waiting for a while. Go ahead, Josh. Hey, hey. how are you guys doing tonight? Very good, good, man. How are you doing? Good, good. No, I, I appreciate you being here, Rob, and and Sean, of course. We we always like to see your face. Well, awesome. Thank you. Well, just this, just the angle. That's all we want. Okay. That's all you're gonna get. <laughs> no, um, well, I, like I said, I, uh, I'll say the typical big fan, Rob, but is Kevin Nash gonna be here? So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't. Anyway, bad he, but Jericho will be. Yeah, Jericho will be. Yes, yes. No, we. Uh, um, oh, I got but, it. <laughs> yes. I yeah, have to call back. I don't know if it's gonna call back. Me. Call back. <laughs> Horrible joke to try there. Um, Love me a little RVD. You almost can't talk about RVD without mentioning a little THC from the RVD. So consider this the high spot of the show brought to you by our guy, Mickey Ray Sinatra. And get blitzed lit aid. Kev has vouched for this week after week. We've had people post in the comments. This is nano-infused Delta 9 THC sipping syrup. Okay. Kev enjoys the Delta 9 sip and syrup, a uh, key lime pie flavor in the Zero uh, sp Sprite. I guess I could say the product. Sprite? Lemon lime beverage. It's super potent stuff. THC on steroids. It's a syrup. 
you mix it in like any other beverage, uh, it mix in, in any beverage, I should say, like a tea or uh, perhaps a white soda, like our friend Kevin, with as little as a teaspoon. It's a fast onset, 5 to 15 minutes, nano-infused, means it goes right to your bloodstream, okay? Bypasses the breakdown in the liver. I don't know, I got a little southern there. Bypass breakdown in the liver, works like alcohol, it's a tolerance killer. This is not gas station Delta 8 bullshit, this is the real deal, THC Delta 9. The THC you get from marijuana. If you are in Maryland, okay, you can actually go to the Stay Lit Smoke Shop. But for the rest of us, it's legal right now to ship from the Get Blitzed website to all 50 states without a med card, as long as you're over 21. Uh, right now, you could save 15%. We're always looking out for our people. Enter the code CLICK, K-L-I-Q, at checkout. Go to get-blitzed.com. That's get-b-l-i-t-z-e-d.com. And try the Delta 9 THC Sip and Syrup Lit Aid from Get Blitzed. Go get it at get-blitzed.com. Use the promo code CLICK. Save that 15%. Thank you to our friends at Get Blitzed, making the world a happier place. One teaspoon at a time, might I say. You know, I mentioned um, one of my favorite people to talk to was RVD. And you know who another one is, Steve? Since I went out of order, you know who the other one is? <laughs> Kevin Sullivan is the other one. No order needed here. Um, Sullivan's always one of my favorite cats to talk to about. I mean, you could talk to Kevin about wrestling. He's, he's a genius. But um, I love talking to Kevin about anything. He's one of those wise cats. You know? Very wise cat. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Kevin also, uh, if, you, if you've read or listened to Todd is God, then you, of course, have the, uh, all the stories of when Kevin was in early ECW with Nancy and um, the uh, and all the machinations contained therein. So uh, let's check out Kev, talking to Kev. And, um, you know, I mentioned Nancy, it, it, a bold man, a bold man takes his wife on the road in professional wrestling. A bolder man puts her on television, makes her part of the angles. Uh, let's hear what Kev has to say about that. Um, the uh, you did one of the riskiest things in wrestling, and I'm not talking about any of the on camera stuff necessarily. You put your wife at the time on the road and on camera with you. Many wrestlers were probably saying, Are you insane? What was it like traveling and working with Nancy? all the time it's it's hard enough to make a marriage work when you're a wrestler and they're not on the road with you did it exponentially challenge you oh without a doubt it was the biggest mistake i ever made but the thing was we were separated about six to eight months before the divorce came right. i was living in the keys she was living in daytona so it was very difficult, and I would recommend it to anybody for sure. But I see now where the mistakes were made on both sides. So I, I and I'm like Kevin, I don't look back because mm -hmm. yeah. if you look back, it's like Satchel Page said, don't look back, something may be gaining on you. You just right. got to go take it day by day. And go yeah, forward. It's, it's just, uh, I, I remember I asking Kevin a long time ago on camera, I said, my God, you've been married so long. What is the key to a successful relationship in wrestling? And he said, keep your wife off the pirate ship. And you built the pirate ship with your wife next to you. So I'm just that it was uh, uh, quite a task to undertake. You were both successful. I mean, she was great. Well, I was around Kevin and, and, and Nancy. I remember one time we just were, st we were, st that's when we had the, the infamous, like, I don't get the fucking Oz gimmick. And we were sitting there in a fucking a Holiday Inn at the round table in front. And it was one of those fucking, the old Holiday Inn motor lodges where we're on the second floor and you walk out your steel door and you're fucking outside. And we had the fucking drapes wide open, fucking TV on, light on, sitting there fucking smoking a, a fucking joint and handing it back and forth. The three of us are sitting there talking. And that's what Kevin said. Just take the fucking money, man. Like it doesn't need to yeah. make sense. Just take the fucking money. Like you've already signed that. You've already signed the deal. Just take the fucking money. 
she was Nancy was was so loved, uh, Kevin. I'm in in the ECW book. Todd is God. Uh, she was there for for quite a while with with Todd and those guys. After you left, you had gone back to WCW, and she finished up there for a while. And they just all the guys loved her so much. She was a sister and a mother all at the same time to them. Just a real lady in the business. Now she carried a blade in her boot. She probably never had to use it because um, because she was just such a lady. She was so universally loved. Yes, yeah, she was, without question. I mean, uh, you'll never hear me say a bad word about her. Yeah, yeah. We got another question here from, I think it's Peter. I think Peter, are you waiting, Peter, to ask? Let's see, it is Peter. Yeah, hey, guys. Peter Ragazzino, a Jew. Hey, good pronunciation, Sean. Thank you. Good to see you guys. Um, real quick, and I got a quick question. I just want to do a quick put over. It'll lead into the question. Big fan of uh, you, Sean, and the Cape Babe commentaries throughout the years. Uh, I've got a lot of great wrestling knowledge from you and your guests, and I think you're a great host. Thank you. Uh, and to go along with your, your amazingly intelligent co-host and his guest, uh, Kevin and Kevin, I have to say that's something I do respect about you two guys is I think that you're – two of the most intelligent men in the wrestling business. Thank you. Uh, um, and I'd love to hear what you guys have to say indefinitely. Huge 83 Weeks fan. And Kev uh, Sullivan, I've seen pretty much every shoot you've done. And you're just uh, a brilliant, both brilliant, sharp guys. And um, basically my question is um, that you're just, you're so intelligent and quippy with a lot of these phrases. Where did you pick a lot of that stuff up? Was that just from a lot of the older guys? Was that from where you grew up? I've, well, I, I think I picked it up from all the guys I was around. And uh, thank you for saying both of us were intelligent. I think that of all the things Kevin has, it's his intelligence that drove him to the top. Well, I think it's the same with you. I mean, there's there's a reason why, like, there's nobody that that doesn't. I don't know where the fucking uh, the phrase and the valley of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. I don't know where that comes from, except you. But I've I said think... it. I've <laughs> said it a million fucking times, you know. So it's just like to me, I've always looked at you as almost like a prophet. Like, because you, you, you always like with the, with the purple haze and like, it was almost like, I remember when I was young and I was going to drop acid for the first time. And there was this older guy that was in the group and he said, you really got to watch out about dropping acid because Whatever you see when you drop acid can't be unseen. So if you're going to take this trip, realize, man, that you're going to, you, you may go someplace you don't want to go and there ain't no taking it back. It's fucking ingrained in your shit. And I still fucking dropped a couple fucking hits of blotter and he was right. There was some fucking, and I know T dropped some fucking acid and he also did some mushrooms and i remember tristan was very unreligious almost to the point of fucking being a, a, an atheist and he dropped some uh some mushrooms and like five grams and he came to, and i knew they they were safe they're upstairs it was him and his friend uh his bandmate his best friend and um, he came down like 12 hours later and he said, and he just walked and he stood in the back of the couch and he was just looking at Tamara and I. And I said, you all right, man? He said, I don't know if it's God or what it is, but there's something more than this. And he just turned and walked upstairs. And I, I just took it at that. And I was just like, wow. And then when he passed, I started sleeping in this room. And um, on the top of his door in his handwriting, on the back of his door, it says, I love Jesus Christ. 
He's never been religious a day in his life. So I just, so I, when we had some people in the house and I told him, I said, listen, I said, and there's a couple other phrases, you know, on the back of his door that he'd written, he'd written like a poem. And um, I told the, the, uh, the, the, the guys that were, they were painting the room. I said, whatever you do, man, don't, I said, there's a couple of holes in the back of the door where you fucking, you know, you throw knives and shit, crazy shit. I said, patch the fucking holes, paint where those are. I said, but don't fucking don't, don't paint over any of his writing. And uh, I just think that uh, when I was with you, sometimes when you get into the business, like, like I did and you're, you have like you, you had been in the business for so long and then they put us, to, especially when they put us together and you were like, you were, you were my mentor, but we tagged before that right. when I was just the fucking jabron. Like for some reason, we, our, our, our energy kept connecting. They kept, they kept putting us together. And I always learned so much every time I was with you. And then later when my son, when, when, when T, when we came down to the keys and you took the boys out, uh, snorkeling and it was the hottest fucking day on earth in the keys and uh it was like t came back and he wanted to know more about you so he he like he went and and googled all of your like crazy bob wire death matches and and he was just like he was like like dad like Kevin had like a fucking spike and this fucking, he's busting this guy's head open. You know, T was like probably 10 was when he was at your house, you know, he was yeah. young. And, uh, but, um, I'm, I'm kind of talking in circles. Cause I'm stoned, but, uh, it's fun to watch. Yeah. But anyway, it was just, but, but it, it, T, T looked at it the same way. Like, like Kevin was like a, pro, like a, like the, it was a prophet. Like he just, Kevin just fucking knows. Kevin's work, the thing about Sullivan and that it plays into the prophetic thing. We're talking about him like he's not here, but the thing is that his words are a premium. He's not big on chatter. I would imagine I've never been booked by him. Well, no, that's not true. I'm going to tell a story later, but um, I was never in a locker room booked by him, but I'd imagine it's like working with a film director that doesn't over talk. He doesn't over direct you. He doesn't micromanage the scene. Everybody's supposed to know what they have to do. And he gives you the nuggets of wisdom to pull you along. Just enough spokes on the ladder, not the whole thing, enough spokes to pull you along. You know, I, I knew RJ City would be a raucous good time for reasons having little to do with professional wrestling. This was, this was a markish moment for me to talk Dumb old television. Uh, dumb's probably a bad word. Simpler. Simpler's good. I, I think dumb is also good. I feel like in today's age, dumb doesn't mean stupid necessarily. Like it's more of a vibe. You is that true? With... So, so if anyone under forty calls me dumb, I could take well, this as a compliment. I guess when you're describing media as dumb, like I think Joe Dirt is dumb, but I all I was also oh, but thirteen. You love it. Right. Yeah, I was also 13 when I watched right. it. So yeah, it makes sense to time. me. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So RJ um, uh, sat down with us. We talked uh, the AEW pre-show. And um, we, you know, also a little a little nugget. There was some RJ talk about getting a podcast together with Nash. But he held out. He said, fuck you. It's Oliver or nobody. It's uh, the ride or die up in Jersey. It may not be how it happened, but in my mind, I, that's how it did. There might have been a lot of people like RJ City who just weren't as persistent as you. Might be the other way. I answered the phone. <laughs> um, all right, let's check out RJ hanging with uh, Kevin, the crew. Travis Johnson asks um, RJ if you'll be at Wrestle Dream this Sunday. Yes. Um, that's been another blessing in my life. Uh, the wonderful Renee Cap the Paquette. Popped up out of nowhere. I don't know what connection she has to AEW or the AEW roster. But all of a sudden, she's there. And I knew her a little bit before. 
And we thought, well, what are we going to do here? And we we got on camera and it was uh, we had some sort of chemistry in probably the worst way. And now we host every uh, pay-per-view pre-show. So if there's a pay-per-view, Renee and I are at it. And it's this Sunday in Seattle. And it, there is such an art to it. And I now watch them all the time. The pay-per-view intros with, you know, Gorilla and Jesse and uh, Tony Schiavone and Jesse and WCW. There's, there's an art to it. I mean, they've all been done horribly, too. Don't get me wrong. But it's a level I strive to. You know what I'm saying? You don't was have hosting, personalities like that anymore. Was hosting uh, in your in your buffet there when you were considering things to do in the business? I read somewhere where kids would ask you, when, or people would ask you when you were younger, what do you want to do? You said wrestling and entertainment. Yes. It says it on the back of a baseball card I had when I was a kid. I played on a baseball team. It okay. was wrestling and the Muppet Show for me, which really, let's be honest. It's the same John, thing, it's really. The exact same thing. Absolutely. Yeah. And if you've ever seen Kay Ballard throw a working punch, you'll know exactly yeah. what I'm talking about. <laughs> but I had I had a sexual dream with Kay Ballard in it, <laughs> like when, when I was like 14, that just basically, and the whole thing was she was trying to take an inseam measurement of me. <laughs> and it was Kay Ballard. And I mean. <laughs> oh, was it? She had the black bob? Yes. Oh, my God. And I mean, you remember how loud she was? Yes. I mean, it, it, she was that loud in the dream. There was nothing sexual. It was just this. Yeah. It was almost like a, I was, I was, <laughs> I don't know. It wasn't very erotic, I'd imagine. I, I, when she was going for the inseam, I, 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 it was I almost, I wouldn't have woke up. I might have spilled the beans. I don't know. Right. <laughs> Joseph James asks you, RJ, uh, what made you such a fan of Lawrence Welk in his show? Okay. Uh, Lawrence Welk, much like Ed Sullivan, is a guy who should have never been on television. Mm -hmm. Never. He's not handsome. He's not charismatic. He speaks like English is his second language, but it's not. He was born in North Dakota. So I don't understand. He ran a really tight ship. It was almost Mormonish, how they always had to marry into each other, the whole family, you know? Um, right. And and he just thought, well, we'll play all this music and we'll have a nice time. And that was, you know, there were so few options on television that you had to watch Lawrence Well. I remember going to my grandparents, my step-grandparents, and it was like, you would see those curtains... They'd open up, and before you knew it, out came Sissy and Bobby, and it was just like, oh, mother, <laughs> for the love of God, like, yes. you know. I mean, it was like, and that followed the news. So it was like Cronkite, Lauren, I mean, and then you'd finally get Mutual of Omaha and start to pick up a little steam and, and go into Disney. But, uh, yeah, that was that was a Sunday, this is a Sunday night uh spectacular there in detroit for a while yeah and yeah, he's still on back pbs back. they still got the descendants of the family being like most of these people are dead please donate to your local station yeah and uh you know you can catch some of the old like uh like the like the andy williams christmas special like the those pop up on maybe not netflix maybe it's like uh, uh amazon or something every once in a while and you know if younger folk want to see how it was you you hit the nail on the head though rj when you talked about how little choice we had on television back then you had five was it five channels maybe mm. seven so it was you were really if you were going to watch television you were held hostage to whatever those seven offerings were and how I, some of this stuff couldn't have been made probably if if uh if there was more uh more of a democratic uh choice here i sure, remember Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just saying that I remember, you know, it, when I was because I've always been a kid that can't sleep. Like how many times that I would watch the uh, Star Spangled Banner switch into the test pattern. I would watch that transition because that was like I'm I'm taking it as far as I can go, and then finally it would become like. ABC would have 
the late, late movie. And it'd be like, I remember one of them that I'll, I'll never forget this one. It was Espionage in Tangiers. Mm. And it was like, I mean, just, and I'm like six years old. And I'm up at one o'clock watching, watching a movie. And it's just starting. I'm just thinking to myself, like, with commercials, I got two hours. Easy. Like, I'm going to be like, this is. And now, last night I get home. What do I do? Eh, let's watch four episodes of uh, Pacific on uh, on. What is and, it? And like, it's uh, it's the it's, it's the break off. It's Band of Brothers, but it's now instead oh. of being in Germany, now we're we're in the Pacific Islands. There was a spinoff to Band of Brothers. I didn't even know that. Yeah, Spielberg. It was still twenty eleven. I think. Director. Okay. 20, summer 2010 and, uh, what's that pretty sure it was the summer 2010 they came they came out with the pacific and i remember yeah, I enjoying it, it and then nobody talking about it I, my my son and i watched it and um we really enjoyed it it's actually like you, you don't re- realize how gruesome that bat like you know because that doesn't get any coverage the Guatemala Canal, like you hear that, but in the, like, like the island, like I didn't realize how much fighting happened in the Pacific and and, and the Samoan Islands. Mm-hmm. Steve, while I have you here, is this true that Joseph James, who asked RJ the question about Lawrence Welk, is related to Lawrence Welk? That's what Joseph James is saying in the chat, and I didn't want to. I didn't want to call him out, see if he wanted to come on audio to maybe he's it. one of the aforementioned uh, offspring uh, or, yeah. or descendants that host on PBS. Joseph, l- let us know. I mean, you want the airtime. You got it here, brother. You, know, I, you don't have to phone the question. You don't have to mail the questions. You can. I asked him to unmute. To make. Yeah. yeah we, there's a lot you asked me to unmute for like 15 minutes. So. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing my damnedest. <laughs> we run a tight RJ, auditory shift here. Can I also bring up this because you just reminded me? Yeah. After our interview in by the pool, Kevin messaged me before you, Sean, and said that was great. We should do it for an hour a week for them. Well, he asked everyone. I was just the one who took it. Yeah. Well, I went high up the chain. I said, guys. He wants to do something. Can we do this? No, they'd rather have Edge and, and Christian do that thing they, they did. Wait a minute. I was to- I got as high as I could go up that chain, and I was told they wanted to do one with you and JBL. Yeah, that works. Yeah. You know what? I think what it was was I actually I actually can I I, I uh, consulted RVD and he said it would be, it would be bad for my Zen. So, absolutely, a loud <laughs> Texan. Woof. Uh, who was my favorite? It's it's there's some people, especially when I first started doing Hey, there were people like Arn Anderson who just said yes without having any idea what he was walking into. And he thought it was going to be a serious interview. He said, I don't know. They said, this guy interviews you and you whatever. And he was like, all right. And we were just two people who should not be in the same room. Yeah. You know? Oh, and I could see that going right off the rails. Is this on video? Yes. They're all oh, on no. video. And we, okay. it was just, it was like a great first date. You know? Yeah. Opposites really so, attract. But I, I, so how many people know how good of a worker you were? Um, his I mom, my mom, yeah, my mother. Uh, some people know. Some people I've I've wrestled before, and they knew, like you know, Wardlow. I wrestled before. Right. I mean, uh, MJF and I did like, a few shows. I never, I never understood. Like there was a ten year period where I would specifically talk to different people, at, like TNA at, at WWE at NXT. I'm like. Like, you know, there's nobody like this guy. And the thing is, he's not going to get, like, the, it's, 
doesn't matter what he does in the ring because he's going to give you a seven minute segment that's going to be like nothing else you have. And th- but I, when you when you don't know what an impressionistic painting is, it really doesn't mean it, it doesn't matter, right? Because their their idea is dogs, you know, playing cards. And that's it. I mean, they, that's just all they, they are, oh, okay, but can you do dogs playing cards? Not so much. Water lilies, maybe dogs playing cards, not so much. Right, right. And that that is also, has sometimes been the problem where I, even doing doing my shows, where people go, oh, you're just going to make fun of me because they don't, they don't think, they don't see what I see yet. And then once I show them the jokes and what I'm actually going to do, they go, oh, okay. But if you leave them to their devices, they'll think of certain things. You know what I mean? Trying to bury me, right? And it's like, no, no, this is just idiotic. We're we are lampooning an interview. We can all calm down. But everybody's been great once they see. Minoru Suzuki was another one who was just. I never thought I would get him at all, and he only says two words in English during the whole interview. And I, by the end, I was covered in sweat, and it's everything I wanted, really. <laughs> Almost had the RJ and Nash podcast. You almost did. Could have. I don't know if it was almost, but it, it, it could have happened. Would have been lovely. Different show, but lovely. Kevin would have had a beef up on his love boat, I think. Um, although he was on love boat. Which was 50% of the, uh, the hosting team of Click This, the Kevin Nash podcast, can say they were on the redo of love boat. But one of the things that has been here since the beginning with Click This, the Kevin Nash podcast, is Blue Chew. They sponsored our uh, Stiff One of the Week segment, currently sponsoring the Tap Out, wherein I play play video and audio almost impossible to bear for more than a set amount of time. And we see how long Kevin uh, it takes for Kevin to tap out. But Blue Chew, if we're talking about sex, guys... I want you to remember the days uh, when you were ready to go, anytime. Like a, like a fireman. When the bell went off, you were there. Hose out. Um, the, uh, the extra increased performance and confidence is available to you once again. Thanks to our friends at BlueChew.com. It's a unique online service. They deliver the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, it's in chewable tablets. It's a fraction of the cost. Just pop one anytime, day or night, and things are looking that they might get a little rosier later on. Pop a blue chew, chew it. They taste great. And, uh, and you're ready to go. You're ready to go in minutes. So I want you to sign up at bluechew.com, okay? Consult with one of their licensed medical providers. Once you're approved, you receive the prescription within days. The best part, it's all done online. I'm talking no visits to doctor's office, no standing in the pharmacy with the script in your hand that you're holding face down. No awkward conversations, okay? This is 100% online. Tablets are made in the USA, prepared, shipped directly to you in discreet packaging. So Blue Chew wants you just to have better sex. And what is wrong with that, fellas? Discover your options at bluechew.com. Just chew it and do it. It is this simple. I want you to try this first, okay? We've got a special deal for the listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use the promo code NASH at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com, promo code NASH, to receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. We thank Blue Chew for being part of our show from day one. What else can I say? A lot of love. A lot of love when that happens. A lot of love. And what better a product to offer a lot of love than Blue Chew, for God's sakes. Enzo Amori. Okay. Uh, real one, whatever you want to call him. We talked about him on air. This, this guest spot was kind of a natural evolution of... Um, <clears throat> I talked about his ability to be cap- captivating on the mic. We talked about the things in wrestling, Steve, that... Uh, that couldn't be taught, uh, those old school values of being able to be a persona consistent when you pick up the mic with what you're doing in the ring. And we I, we played a clip, and I thought he, he was tremendous, and the, that manic kind of promo is very much him. You know, he's a, a talkative guy. But uh, we wanted to have him on and talk about that that elusive thing, that uh, being able to talk, and everybody loves Enzo anyway, right? 
I loved Enzo. I loved Enzo's appearance. One of my favorites, actually. Yeah. Th- that this appearance. Oh, and he he could talk the ears off a goddamn brass monkey, couldn't he? Holy Moses. So um, let's check out Enzo. We talked about his working with Brian Pillman Jr. And then um, everyone remembers the Survivor Series, quote unquote, appearance in, uh, in 2018 and how he was using that um, to, uh, to promo an upcoming event. So let's check out Enzo. Qatar called me to book me. I told them I wouldn't take the booking unless they booked Pillman as my opponent. So then they booked Pillman and he was so happy. That like and he and that but that was unbelievable. I mean, we went to Qatar. I'd never been there before. International booking. You introed me, bucket list check to the ring in that match. Um, and the match I had before that with Pillman was the first match I'd ever had outside of WWE at the Mid Hudson Civic Center. And it was because when I met Pillman, he came up to me and I didn't even know he was Pillman. I just saw the hair and I was like, oh, this kid looks awesome. He's over with me. He's got heat just by the fucking hair he's got. And I mean, heat in the locker room. You know what I mean? Like this kid's the man. And he walked up to me and he's like such like glowing, open it. And he's like, yo, man, I'm buddies with Stone Cold. You know, my, my dad was Brian Pillman. And I just thought to myself at that moment, I love you, but everyone's going to hate you. That You're going to have yeah, so oh, much absolutely. fun. Like, I, I was like, Bro, like, I love that about you, that you came up to me like that, and I get why other people are going to look at you and hate you, bro, because I, I, you, I yeah. get it. I yeah. get it, right? So I popped for him, and I asked the promoter. I was the first indie show I'd ever done. It was John Moxley versus Big Cass at Six Flags Great Adventure in a sold-out Gotham City Batcave, right? And I do this show, and I'm managing Big Cass, and on that – card is where i met pillman and then he said to me he goes oh you know i was asking stone cold for advice and you know what he told me learn how to work the stick like enzo and, wow. and i went oh. i went holy <laughs> shit wait repeat yourself bro i was like wait 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 are you lying so then i went up to that promoter and i went where's your next show and where where is it like when's your back and he said mid hudson civic center that was where i had my last match in wwe 205 live i was like i'm in a simulation fuck it let me i want to work pillman on that card let's come to a number and get me i do my first indie show so i got paid more than a, almost a pay-per-view for wwe you know what i mean to wrestle pillman and i told him i want to name my opponent and i said i want to wrestle pillman so that was pillman's first big match and i knew i could get eyes on him because i it was my first match so whoever my opponent is, people are, you know what I mean? So like, let me give this kid the rub. And in in essence, I knew you didn't have a dad growing up, bro. I know you're ju- just breaking into this business and I don't have to see a fucking documentary and all fucked up your life probably was, bro. So let me, I wanted to work him and it meant the world to me to have that match. And he trusted me, he was young, but I called the whole thing to him, right? And I called it in the ring and- we planned out some spots, you know what I'm saying? But I had called it and I'll never forget in the ring with him. I call a spot. I call tackle drop down leapfrog. And when I, t- when I do the spot, he does the leapfrog. I mean, I do the leapfrog when he's taking off from the leapfrog. He's like, what's next. Right. When I do that, cause he, I didn't call a tackle drop down leapfrog. What the fuck's next. Right. When I jumped in, did the leapfrog i pretended i tore my acl and just sold my knee and went to a corner because my first match back and 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 i went to a corner and i and i like put up the x and the referee put up the x like it was real and pillman was all bugged out like oh shit like what did i do oh no and i was working them i I was just faking an injury for fucking a minute right but i didn't tell pillman i was going to do that so when pillman was looking at the aisle. I was like, look at the, tell, I told the ref, I was like, tell him to look at the aisle. When he looked at the aisle, I went up from behind him and I didn't hit him from behind and glom him. Like everybody would expect that's what wrestlers do. Right. I put him in a fucking headlock. Cause I wasn't able to out wrestle before that. Right. So I grab a headlock and I start like, ah, ha, ha. and I tell him belly to back me, do my dance. And he belly to backs me and he gets up and he does my dance. And it was louder for any move he could have hit me with. He could have hit me with any move in a book. I could have called any move for him. But that fucking him doing my dance because I hadn't done it yet in the match, that was it, boy. And that was that was 
And I was like, that's pro wrestling, kid. Like, that's how we fucking do this shit. And he was so mind blown in the moments. Like, he was like, oh shit, he told me to do his dance and I did it. They went nuts. You know what I mean? And we came through the curtain. I, I had never worked like that in my life. I came out with no music, wet hair, and I did not dance and I did not do shit. I came out to no music, right? Like, and my jacket said, let the bridges that you burn light the way on the back. And uh, I just wanted to have a wrestling match that was a real wrestling match that no one ever saw me do. They don't know I can wrestle because I played Enzo Amore and you can never see me fucking wrestle because that's the character I played and that's not going to happen in the script that, that I'm handed, right? And I'm not going to... Good luck trying to convince AJ Styles or Seth Rollins to go have a wrestling match with Enzo Amore at that time. You know what I mean? Granted, it's been very... It's been years since then and you know, I, I would hope that somebody would want to fucking, you know, maybe exchange some wrist locks with me, but still that doesn't happen often. But I wanted to put one of them on film that's out there for the world. And that video has like 300,000 views on my YouTube of my match mm -hmm. with Brian Pillman Jr. So it did the trick and it got more views than anything he ever got on AEW Dark. That's like me. I, I've got, I've got a, a fucking a TNA. I've got a fucking, it's out there somewhere. I think I was wrestling uh, Jay Lethal. I fucking gave him an arm drag. I did a lock up <laughs> arm drag. And fucking, I mean, it's just like the fucking people were just like, they went crazy. Just to see me <laughs> arm just sink in deep like Steamboat, and hit, hit him with an arm. Because my, my whole thing is, we, like we were talking earlier, it's about the kids. It's just like my favorite wrestler living in Detroit. Was a guy named Moose Chodlak. He was a six foot six guy, <laughs> owned a bar, wore a fucking moose he, head. He had the gimmick on his head, right? Yeah, yeah, he wore a moose head. He was like six six. Guy had less fucking moves than I did. I think he had two. One was take the fucking moose head off. But he was my favorite wrestler. So that's what I always would tell people I'm like, hey, you don't understand how this fucking business goes. But, you know, I want to talk about uh, something that I've seen years ago that even to this day, I come back and, and fucking laugh at. Like, I try to visit it once a year because it's hilarious. It's the day that you snuck in to a Survivor Series in full Sherlock Holmes, you know, uh, outfit, you know, completely hidden in disguise and jumped was up I, was the I trouble. In, in was I in full? All I had on was Beatles wig. Was it okay? <laughs> I don't remember exactly. It wasn't much, it wasn't much to it. Yeah, I got um, you through, and I got you there. What was that? I mean, what was that like? It was hilarious, and I fucking love it to this day. It's it's non scripted, unscripted stuff that just randomly happens, and it was fucking amazing. Well, I mean, the way I look at it was uh, the payoff was was Madison Square Garden. Uh, completely worth it, right? Oh, like. Yeah. Every chance that I took that day was for the booking in Madison Square Garden with Ring of Honor, um, and I and I and and a reunion with Big Cass on the on the, the tails of that. When you see me and Big Cass jump a guardrail at Ring of Honor, I lent it a lot of credibility by showing up to the WWE event. And the reason why the Ring of Honor event was not shot by the cameramen on premise that day was because. I told Joey Mercury, the producer, who was one of my first coaches in the WWE when I got hired. He was in the staff of coaches. It was just, uh, you know, life coming together, like I said, like a simulation, man. Like the first booking me and Cass get outside of WWE is Madison Square Garden. And the first show ran by a non-McMahon in 60 years. Like, you can't make this shit up. So um, the reason why I did the Survivor Series was for the Garden booking. Um, and man, if you Googled my name at that time, you would see a lot of things about, uh, my, my departure from the company. Okay. Yeah. And I know what shock value can do and I'm a worker. And at this point I don't work for anyone and there's no one paying my bills and you're not putting food on my plate and I don't owe you anything. So if I'm in the business of the real one brand that I'm launching this new brand of mine, real one, and I show up at that event, 
and all I had to pay was $2,500 for that front row ticket. And I trend number one in the fucking world. Not Brock Lesnar, who was the champion. Not the pay-per-view itself, Survivor Series. I trend number one in the world that night. I mean, if I told you that you can, for $2,500, trend number one in the world, and when I type your name in now, I don't see all that bullshit about you getting fired as much as I see about this shit that happened, right? Brilliant. It, Brilliant. It, it was headlines. It removed bad headlines out of my out of mine. And then it also parlayed me an opportunity it back into pro wrestling. It was just unfortunate that timing wise, you know, me and Big Cass, we couldn't end up working. Uh he ended up, you know, having to take care of himself. And which he did, and he got in the best shape of his life, and you see where he's at now. So everything happens for a reason. Um, if we would have wrestled together that time with the with the heat that we had and this, that, and where he was mentally, where I was at <laughs> mentally, we would have ended up, you know, further damaging our reputations in the business, which were was unwarranted to begin with. Cause if you really look at it, like we were in the WWE, I was for seven years and was supposed to be on TV the night I got fired. It wasn't like I got fired that night because I wasn't doing my job. Right. No, All right. Sir, thank uh, you, David. Hey, you guys have a great night. Um, I you hope, as well. Uh, Feel better, man. Feel better. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Take care. Josh. That was awesome. Enzo making a scene. Enzo making a scene on Survivor Series, making a scene on Nash and Friends. I have a feeling he makes a scene almost everywhere he goes. I don't think he knows any other way. Yeah. He's, if, if you're with Enzo, you're making a scene. But listen, that's, you know, that, that's what wrestling was. Look at these guys that were on the road back. And I always go old school. I guess I, I shouldn't always harken back, uh, always likening the things I like about wrestling now to a similarity 40 years ago or 30 years ago. But um, I well, guess that's what old people it's... do. Of course, that's what, like, earlier earlier in this show, we had that clip where it was Nash and Waltman talking specifically about how if the NWO or Click, the Click could have worked in modern wrestling. And I think there's an element of that in every business with every person over a certain age. Clinging yeah, to I mean, how people things always go, worked when well, it worked for them. LeBron, would, would LeBron been able to play in Larry Bird's court or on, you know, Wilt's court? Yeah, I, I get it. I guess. And, I guarantee you when Ricky Steamboat and Ric Flair were working, there were old timers talking about how they were working too fast. Like that's just a perpetual conversation among a certain age group. But I feel like I wanted to say, shut the fuck up. When someone would say, would say to me, yeah, but Michael Jordan couldn't have played in Jerry West's time. You know, it's the people to hear now. Well, Bruno Sammartino and Hans Mortier. Just shut the fuck up. So maybe I should just shut the fuck up and well, intro the next clip. It's Alex Shelley. Alex Shelley. Uh, this one was in the, the works for a few months, actually. We wanted Alex and Kevin to reunite on uh, Nash and Friends, talk about their paparazzi production days back um, when the uh, Motor City Machine Guns were on TNA. And uh, Kev was in those hilarious clips. Uh, very obviously, much of it ad-libbed. When you get a few uh, witty guys on camera in pro wrestling, that happens. Not unlike the NWO days, right? They, uh, it was a, a hearkening back to that. Since once again, I will make reference to the NWO <laughs> when talking about paparazzi. But yeah, in, in all fairness, NWO and paparazzi productions, it was like nine years difference. So it wasn't that far uh, in the past. Yeah. It is today, but not when uh, Paparazzi Productions was a thing. I've, I do remember at TNA. the time that the wrestling zeitgeist felt that Nash was somehow like debasing himself for those bits, and I never felt that way. I felt he was doing what you're supposed to do in pro wrestling, which is make the most impact with the lowest amount of, I don't want to say effort, but the lowest amount of like effort on your body, the lowest amount of resource. If you're going to put Kevin on camera with these guys, and you want it to be something to tune in for you have to take the shackles off a guy like kev and do what he wants to do i won't say like it was in the nwo i won't say it but you have to free these guys up to do that kind of stuff and tna did it couldn't happen now and that's what we talk about here uh on this show uh when we reference paparazzi productions but first i want to do a clip about kid rock you know the detroit thing very big with alex and kev but um 
when you mentioned Kid Rock and the 313, things may not be as they always appear. People think that Kid Rock has changed, but it's like Kid Rock never fuck. There we go. There she is. Just fuck you. Look at, <laughs> look at Kid Rock over there. Trying, like, you motherfucker. But like Kid Rock is from Romeo, Michigan. That's like so far out of the Oh, it, I mean, it's, I mean, all Kid Rock did was, like, I used to tell my son all the time, like, the, the only thing making money right now is country music. You can fucking write songs. You fucking can write lyrics. Like, just write a bunch of country shit. Like, and sell it. I said, then when you become fucking Tristan Nash, the country star, you go, you know what, man? But this is really my roots. And you play your Radiohead fucking type shit. I said, Kid Rock did the exact opposite. He yeah. acted like he was fucking from the city and right. fucking all this shit. And then the next thing you know, this motherfucker's Hank Williams Jr. Jr. How about the right. little guy, Joe C? Did he have any street cred at least? Oh, from fuck From Detroit yeah. proper or fuck, he oh, was Taylor. From, I think it was from, where's Taylor? He was from Taylor. He by the airport. Yeah, Taylor's like a rough suburb of yeah. Detroit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're getting into like kind of like a, a little bit more rural area, if you know what I'm saying? I, I, we, used to, we called it Taylor Tucky. When Taylor we Tucky, of course. Of course, man. <laughs> like, it's like, like the tough every, redneck there. Yeah, it's one of those pla it's one of those places where fucking if you don't know somebody that fucking's cooking meth, fucking <laughs> you know their best friend. I it's, mean that, it's it's fucking it's and they and, yeah. and, and back in the day they used to call it crank. <laughs> it wasn't it's, meth, man. It was crank. Taylor was like, you're you're Ooh. getting I, we're gonna be in the sticks real soon, man. Yeah, you, you go to fucking you go to a you go to a fucking uh, a Kmart in 1980 and go for <laughs> blue eye eyeliner. It's out. There's <laughs> every piece of white trash has got the orange hair. They got fucking. They're the, they're the place that if you call for pizza, you get hungry Howies. Yeah, <laughs> I mean it's like fucking. It's oh my god. I mean, now it's like you got the kids down there. It hasn't changed, right? Like no. that's still it's still the demographic, right? For more or less, the kids. Oh, are yeah. You got bumper stickers with red, white, and true, and you know these souped up F three fifties, like little guys behind the wheel, but they're they're wiry. You don't want to fuck with them, you know? They'll cut you. With they like all got guns. Yeah. Oh, for sure. They're all armed in the teeth, and it's like. God forbid you say something. I don't know, man. I feel like guns are kind of killing people nowadays. Like, well, that's what you have to have them, right? These guys got ammo buried in their lawn, and it's like, oh shit! All right, this is a yeah. no way. Hey, yeah. The fuck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. It, 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 Taylor Chucky was it was. Or man, it, we used to pound them in basketball. I just no, pound I pound them. Just I yeah, imagine. just kill them. They had yeah, a, they not... had, yeah, they had one good player the whole time I was there. He was a, a six foot seven or eight kid named Tommy Shen, white boy. And uh, but if you if he if he if you heard him on the phone, you would have swore he was from like, you know, Deporis down in Detroit. You know, just you know, he had had, had the whole uh, had a down to act. Yeah, yeah, had that. Yeah, the act down. Yeah, you played for Aquinas, right? Yeah, I went to Aquinas. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought Aquinas fan. Because yeah. that was it was great because you played in the in the in the Detroit Catholic League. So oh, you got to play, so you got to play like you could play like all kind of different teams. Yeah. Yep. You know, I mean yep. it, it was mostly a white league, but then like the what the, there's an east and west. The east was all the black teams. Right. You know, St. Mary's, Servite, Deporis. So yep. you got to play, you know. If if I would have stayed down river, I, you know, I wouldn't. Have, I remember uh, my freshman year. I th yeah, I think it was my freshman year, and I was and I was in Trenton, and we played Northwestern, and they beat us like ninety eight to thirty five, and I had twenty one. Jeez, <laughs> I'm like man, I gotta like, get out. Oh. 
I mean, that, that was just like genocide on the basketball courts. Yeah, it, was, it really was. I was just like, wow, man. Yeah. Back in the day, and like still, especially now, right, Kev? Like, but some of those Catholic schools were like college prep for the athletes, right? Oh, like, they, oh, they, 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 oh Bur Birmingham Brother Rice, Catholic yeah. Central. All right, so I'm a Catholic Central kid, man. Yeah, are you? Yeah. Oh, Catholic yeah. man, Catholic Central beat us for the uh, the Catholic League championship my senior year. Oh, really? Yeah, they all oh. University of Detroit Fieldhouse. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. They played there for a long time. I mean, they're just immaculate in sports across the board, right? Yeah. But when I went there, we were in Redford at this, like, right on the cusp of, like, Telegraph. You know, like, you right. go to Detroit, you're in um, Brightmore, actually, right? Like, a bad area. But when I was there, it was just this abandoned elementary school that they bought up. So you had a thousand kids sharing lockers and all this bullshit, the portable classrooms, and they're just hoarding money, right? And eventually... Uh, 2005, they moved out west, like Novi, bought land, and now it's like a college campus. Right. Like it's, and most colleges, like holy shit, man. Yeah, so yeah. kind of and, that, and that was like didn't like Birmingham, like the Country Day was another one. Yep, Country Day, like, man. Country Country Day was the same thing. Like you go by, <laughs> you go by Orchard Lake High School. I mean, I mean that's whole... like it's like Malibu. Yeah, it's on, it's it's on a, a lake, and you know, like it's got a turf field, and yeah, you know, yeah, probably holds like more people than the Eastern Michigan fucking you know, <laughs> Mac football yep. game. Yeah, it's that's like, just like for nice stuff, right? Yeah. Who does? Well, anyone who's filtering into the room, you might notice we have Alex Cham with world us, champion as promised. Yes, the and world our champion. Took a minute. But uh and uh, of hey, course guys. everybody remembers the uh the the vignettes with Kev in uh in TN. I'm sure we'll get questions about that. But if you want to ask anything, just uh send I have, a, I, have a, I have a question for Alex. Alex, of all the ones start it off. Did, of all the ones we did, besides you you popping me with Cecil Fielder. <laughs> Which one do you like? Which one do you remember? Like, which one? Like, if, if somebody says, "Ah, the paparazzi things you and Alex did, or you and Ash did," like, which yeah. one like comes to mind? For me, my personal favorite was the first one we ever did, where you had the ink board. Oh yeah, and that <laughs> that was just fucking genius. And I think the thing that people don't realize a lot about these were that we had no script whatsoever. Uh, so us doing whatever we wanted to do. And then eventually, once we got comfortable with each other, which was pretty fucking quick, it was just back and forth, back and forth. And there was right. so much. I like, think the I, one I remember the most, though, the one that, like, guys today who are in their 20s in all these bigger companies bring up to me, everybody loves the fucking push-up contest, the musical chairs, the limbo. Like, that, yeah. that one's yeah. Yeah, the PCS. We, the um, one of my favorites is I was the judge and I had like a a, a hearing over you guys, and then we're we're we we we're, we're talking at the urinal, and I I I say something, and I walk away from you, and I forget who's next to you, but you just go. Have you been doing lunges? Because my ass is hanging <laughs> out of my rope, and I just I just thought like. Could you imagine that getting on TV now? No, no none of it would. How, none, why do I? None, why do I, why do I have to go first because you're black? Not yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Not. Swing low, sweet chariot. Accusation oh. destroyed. Like, oh no, these these are not okay anymore. Yeah, no, it's yeah, yeah. We um, but the spontaneity is also what you're not allowed to have today because everything has to be so tightly scripted to control right. what goes on TV. They weren't even, there weren't even people around when we did it. It was Borash, me, and Alex. It was a, We were doing these things at 11 o'clock at night. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah we, like, like at Orlando Ale House, nobody's there. It's a Sunday night at, you know, 10 p.m. Like they're about to close up. And it's like, all right, well. We should probably do one now. We're going to gas stations. I mean, we there was so much yeah. footage that they ended up not using, but there were at one point going to put out like a bonus DVD. Yeah, the they, best of. 
yeah, but they have hours of shit that like we never ended up using, which I, I, man, I would kill to get my hands. I on would that. too. Yeah, That's what I was going to ask too. Alex and, and yep. Kevin, wh who made the decision when you would shoot a bunch of shit and, and show it to them, who was it mostly a time constraint thing or were they judging the content also? Why did some stuff get nixed just cause you had so much? Jeff, Jeff was a fan of it, of course. Uh -huh. And it, I think yep. it like it, Borash was in charge of it. Yep. Like he shot it and edited yep. it. So like, I yep. think it was, you know, but at the same time, I think when they broke down numbers and saw that it, it always like, you know, coming up next is paparazzi productions. Like people can, you know, it held better than 90% of the fucking matches. That they right. fucking, <laughs> By far, like, I can't tell you a single match that I had at that point in time for like six months, you know, because it was also uh, handsome compared to what we were doing, which was way more entertaining, way more different. But I think ultimately it boiled down to like, you know, it was a show an hour at that point, maybe. So 44 minutes, 48 yeah. minutes. And I think as much as I would have loved to have a 15 minute paparazzi production segment, they just <laughs> for X amount of minutes per show. Did you watch um, on Netflix, did you watch Tim Robinson's show? King Gunter the Third has a question, a written question. He says, uh, who's responsible or how did paparazzi come about? And if Alex still keeps in touch with any paparazzi production members that aren't in impact anymore, like Jay Lethal. Oh, yeah, definitely. Like the original gimmick was uh, one that Dutch Mantel used in Puerto Rico. And in 2006, which is when we started doing this stuff, um, the major knock against the X Division was that you had a lot of guys who were great wrestlers with dark hair and kick pads and short trunks. And it was honestly a pretty viable knock. So you look at the beginning of 2006 and like suddenly my hair's bleached out and I started wearing different gear. And, uh, they wanted to uh, include Kevin. Uh, in, in the original plan too, in March was okay. Well, we'll put Shelly with him because we gave him this gimmick that I used in Puerto Rico and had him as like a voyeur type character to instigate feuds. But if we put him with Nash, we'll make him Nash's young boy. And after about maybe 30 minutes of me and Kevin being in the room together, I remember there was like a sheet. They actually wrote out like a script for us. And he goes, I'm not. Kevin. Or like uh, I'm not going to use a script and I, I'm not going to treat you like my young boy. We're just going to go back and forth. Is that cool? And I was like, fuck yeah, that's cool. So that's how it went from there. And after that, I think it was just supposed to be like a short term thing, but Kevin fucking killed it. I think I did all right too. And the shit was fun to do. And I think no, that we, kill, we, we killed it. You, you, we, yeah. fucking, we killed it. Yeah. So they, I think they had no choice, like, but to keep going with it. Cause it was going to lead to what you and Saban in a s singles match. I ended up wrestling him. Yeah. Yeah. You guys had a good you, Yeah. Cause you, cause you, you, you fucked him. Yeah. We had to cheat to beat him. And, uh, I think that was going to be like the end of the paparazzi productions thing with Kevin, but like, nope, we, we got to keep going with it. So, yeah. Thank I'm God. Sure. Yeah. Kevin did that arm drag. That's right. Yeah. You locked up with them and just fucking took them down like steamboat. It was awesome. You, Steve, do you have one of the one of the one of the paparazzi production clips we can show? One of the yeah. one of the better ones. See what you see what you can grab over there. Um, They're all hyper hyper gay too. God, uh, yeah. There's some serious homosexual. That, you yeah, guys were ahead of your time, clearly. Yeah, yeah. I know. It's just we were hyper. It's like. <laughs> I don't, it's just so weird how people are so homophobic, you know, and it's just like we were just, I don't know. We loved it. But yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, nobody ever mentions that to me. Nobody ever says, like, wow, yeah, no. there's, there were some real gay overtones there. Like, oh, I've never heard that. I think they just, man, that shit was funny as hell. <laughs> it would be nice if it was. It was out of sync. It was out yeah, of sync. Gee, it was like watching fucking. <laughs> it was like watching uh, Japanese TV when I found my first run. It's <laughs> fucking ninety fucking two. <laughs> that was the famous ass shot we referenced before. Yeah, we. Yeah, and a, and my, a call back to the uh, the reference of the uh, homoeroticism of the, my ass actually looks fucking better now. I just, <laughs> jeez.
Prove it. So if the reunion's going to happen, damn it. <laughs> I don't believe you. Hey, was that when you with Liger? Was that 92 when you were yeah, in New yeah. Japan? Yeah, dude. I, I, you know, you, so I like stayed in the dojo a little bit in 2012. I'm like, Liger's room was next door to mine. And I remember talking to him about that, too. I told him you were <laughs> one of my trainers. And he just fucking a big like, what? Really? I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. Big senpai to me. Wow. Yeah. He's my tag team partner. I was like, oh, yeah, I know. Right. Oz and Jushin Liger. Awesome. Yeah. We fucking, I, I came over there. I was a fucking absolute laughing stock as the Oz character. And then three weeks later, he and I are, are, are being crowned the <laughs> crush, crush the super heavy tag team champions. <laughs> we won the tournament. I just, love it. It's, it's just like, ugh. I think we I think we wrestled Norton and Hase in the fucking finals. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Little little kid rock talk. I know you're a big kid rock mark yourself, so uh I don't know if you're offended by any of the aforementioned discussion. <laughs> I I was a fan of the uh, the pre country kid rock. Okay. The one that they were saying was the fake one. Devil without a cause, kid yes, rock. Yes, very much devil. I could I could still rock Devil Without a Cause. Oh, that it's a fun it's a phenomenal uh it's a phenomenal album. It's a phenomenal record. Not to do with kids these days, but kids these days don't listen to albums. No, they don't. They love these 18 songs mashed together from 15 artists. Yeah, and it's a, it's a singles universe. But hey, what the hell do we know? Let me tell you what I do know, Steve. I do know we will be back next week, next Monday. I hope everyone's Thanksgiving was, was, was great. I want to say that. I forgot to say that at the top. But um, yeah, what else can I say? We'll be back next week. With Kev at my side, he is recovering, and uh, his voice will be back and strong, long and strong, and down to get the friction on. So uh, from the uh, control center here in friggin' New Jersey, thank you, Steve. Thank you to everyone listening. And uh, I'm going to speak for Kevin on this one. We're going to do another one next week. Yeah, the customer.